Hey, everybody. I'm going to have to make today's briefing a little bit short since I've uh, got uh, something following this. So we'll get, uh, I just have a, a quick something at the top and then we'll get right to it. Uh, in Central African Republic, the United States condemns the violence surrounding protests on the 24th uh, of October in the Central African Republic. We call on all Central Africans to reject violence and refrain from rhetoric that could incite violence. A UN peacekeeping mission in Central African Republic is an essential element in the security necessary uh, for the CAR to move beyond crisis. The United States strongly supports the work of our UN and our Central African partners to promote peace and long-term stability in CAR. Inclusive dialogue is the key to preventing further unrest and maintaining the progress achieved by President Twadera, the Car government, and MINUSCA to ensure a peaceful future for all Central Africans. We welcomed the first meeting on the 12th of October uh, of the Consultative and Oversight Committee of the National Program of Disarmament, Demobilization, Reintegration, and Repatriation, and the participation of most of the CAR's armed groups. We encourage those groups that have not yet sent representatives to do so now. That, Matt. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to start uh, somewhere in an unusual or different place than we have been doing normally. Um, and I realize that both Ambassador Power, US UN, and the White House have spoken about this, so I'll be uh, already, but I'll be brief. Um, on the uh, abstention on the Cuba resolution in the General Assembly today, there, as you probably expected, uh, members of Congress who um, do not agree with the administration's approach to Cuba uh, are crying foul about this. And I'm wondering, does the administration no longer believe that it is its obligation as the executive to uphold or defend what is the law of the land? Well, I, I think uh, we've talked about this before, Matt. We understand uh, uh, what the law is, uh, and the embargo is law. And so we have an obligation to obey it, um, and we do. That doesn't mean uh, that, uh, that we can't or shouldn't examine policies um, that we believe are in the best interest of the United States. And the President um, has made a decision, a policy decision, that it is in the best interest of the United States uh, to establish diplomatic relations with Cuba and to seek the end uh, of the embargo. But we all recognize it's still law. Uh, that's, in, that's not being disputed here. What, uh, what we're saying is that, um, that we believe the embargo uh, should be lifted, and the president will continue to work with Congress to that end. Well, I, I think everyone, everyone has heard that argument, but some people don't necessarily agree with it. They would, they, they would say that the law is the law. It's not a policy. It is the law that governs the administration's conduct, and if the administration's conduct doesn't support that, or at least defend it at an, in an international uh, fora, doesn't that suggest, this argument goes, doesn't that suggest that the administration believes itself to be more, uh, the executive believes itself to be more equal than at least one of the other two co-equal branches I, of government that we have in this country? I don't know if it's physically possible to be more equal if you're well, equally it's an ex equal. It's an and expression we, from Animal Farm. You, you yeah. might have... Oh, I see. I, uh, you got me on literature there. Um, but look, uh, we, we obviously are fully cognizant of the fact that the embargo is law. And, and the administration doesn't hold itself above law. Uh, uh, we obey the law, and that is the law. Well, but doesn't you, mean but, that it but doesn't you won't defend it in front of, uh, before an, institute, an international institution that is condemning it? Well, I think as... Ambassador Power said in her statement today, 
Uh, the president made clear his opposition to the embargo and called on Congress to take action to lift it. And yet, while the administration agrees that the U.S. embargo on, on Cuba should be lifted, we do not support the shift for the reason uh, stated in the resolution itself. And as, again, I'm quoting the ambassador, but I think it's important, as she said very clearly, all actions of the United States with regard to Cuba have been and are fully in conformity uh, with the U.N. Charter and international law, including applicable trade law and the customary law of the sea. Um, so any idea or suggestion that, um, that we're somehow trying to flout law here is just inaccurate. But that doesn't mean that, that, doesn't mean that the, uh, the president's policy, while it, while it, it opposes the embargo, is wrong. It's the president's uh, prerogative as commander-in-chief uh, to set foreign policy for the United States. And his foreign policy is that we're going to establish diplomatic relations, we're going to open up our relationship with Cuba, and seek the end of the embargo, and seek the end of the embargo. In other words, work with Congress to that end. Right, um, until you get to that end. We're going to obey the law. Isn't it incumbent upon you that not only obey it, but to defend it against condemnation or criticism? There were other things in the resolution that we took issue with that led to the abstention. Uh, but uh, again, um, right, uh, so. we're going to obey the law. We're going to follow the law. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with it <clears throat> and the basis for it. I mean, you know, we had a, a d discussion the other day, I think, about uh, JASTA. About JASTA. It is the law of the land. We yeah. will obey the law of the land. But Except we objected you're to try to it. and fix it. We objected to it before it was passed. Um, and as I yep. think I made clear that the Secretary is going to stay engaged on this issue uh, uh, to uh, continue to try to seek a better outcome. Uh, but okay. it is the I, law. Yeah. Right. I mean, JASTA is not a very good example because, the, 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 yes, you did object to it beforehand, but you didn't object to the – this administration couldn't have objected to the embargo before it was – because well, the president was just born then, maybe when it passed. Yeah. So there was the the, the the my my the, point. There's is, a big I, difference I, here. I so, didn't mean it was a perfect example. No, but no, The no, point I, I'm trying I, to yeah, make but, is, you can still follow the law, uh, and obey the law at the same time, uh, having a discussion with Congress about your concerns. Right. About it. Except that some of these people, some of the members of Congress who have come out and expressed concern on both sides of the aisle, not just uh, not just Republican frequent. Republican critics of the administration, but Democrats as well, say that if you don't, this is this the embargo has been passed and, and maintained in place by both Democratic and Republican administrations since you know since 1960s. In keeping with the foreign policy agenda of the United States, up right? To, but up to until now. it is no longer the law of the land. You're saying that the executive branch doesn't believe that it it, it has an obligation to, to to defend it. We have an obligation to uh, obey it and to follow it, and that's what we're doing. All right. Do you have any uh, clarity um, uh, on what may have happened with the killing of these 26 Afghan men? Um, yeah, I realize you may not, because it's Afghanistan and there aren't U.S. you know yeah. uh, persons involved, but. Um, the, I guess the key question is whether you think this incident might be uh, 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 whether the killings may have been carried out by Islamic State militants or if that seems implausible to you given the location. There's a lot there, Arshad. It's difficult to know with certainty. And I don't think that, uh, again, my, my Pentagon colleagues might have more information on this, but I don't think they do, that we really know exactly what happened here. Um, so I can't stand here before you and rule out. Uh, that uh, Daesh or ISIL uh, 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 had a hand in this or were responsible. Um, we'll have to uh, try to learn more as, uh, as, as time goes on, since this is a relatively fresh report. That said, um, it, it, is, it is no secret that we have been long concerned about uh, ISIL's eyes on Afghanistan and, and their desires to have a presence there. In fact, for now almost a year and a half, if not two years, President Ghani has spoken about this, and so has our uh, our commanders in, in Afghanistan. So this is something that their desires to metastasize into Afghanistan is something we've been long watching. Um, I certainly could not rule out uh, their hand in this. Uh, we just don't know enough right now. Can we stay on that? Um, sure. The Battle of Musa? Sure. Okay. Is it turning out to be like a slog, or are things moving? How are they prog progressing? So, at least you want to come take the podium? Uh, Not today. 
Not today. Not today. All right. Uh, look, I mean, you know, we're we're how many days into this, Saeed? And now we're we're already we're, talking about slog. What's the ne next thing we're going to be asking about quagmire? Right. I mean, okay. Th 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 this is ju this just started, and and we said all along that this was going to be, first of all, uh, a long road to get to the operation, okay. because it had to be done when the Iraqis were ready, uh, and now they are. Uh, and we said even before, even while we were doing shaping operations, that that taking back Mosul was going to be a tough fight and was going to take a while. Uh, and it was going to be ugly because of the terrain and because of the, uh, the nature of the city itself and their presence in Mosul. Uh, and so look, we're only a few days into this. And actually, they are making good progress. Mm -hmm. uh, they're mainly still on the outskirts of, uh, of Mosul, uh, mm -hmm. but they have achieved a measure of success. And oh, by the way, there's been good coordination between the Peshmerga and the ISF. And there were people, critics saying, well, that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, it's happening. So we got to give them time and space to continue to execute their plan. But military operations uh, are, are never, uh, uh, you know, clear-cut things. There's, there's, there, you're going to meet resistance. The enemy gets a vote. Uh, things don't always go according to plan. I'm not saying that this isn't. I'm just saying that you know, we need to all be prepared um, to watch this on a daily basis and not get ahead of it. Well, you know, because of all these, uh, all the different groups and all the moving parts and this thing, is the United States, is it, maybe has it made a mistake by not taking command and control of this operation and perhaps you know because it has a better you know experience in, in whether in the fight in Mosul in the old days you know, no absolutely not no this this, so this no no I couldn't couldn't disagree more mm -hmm. I mean we we've also long said for going on two years now that in order to achieve a truly sustainable defeat of this group it has to be done with indigenous forces now, one of the lessons we learned over the last 15, 16 years is, yes, the American military can do a lot of things and do it very, very well. Uh, but the way to sustain a defeat against extremists on soil is to make sure that indigenous forces and security and a security apparatus is in place and capable of not only defeating but then stabilizing afterward. Uh, that sometimes the presence of foreign troops alone uh, can be, not, can be an, uh, the irritant required to keep extremists interested in an area, that we can actually make the situation worse. The second thing I say, I see, uh, at least give me a second. The second thing I'd say is uh, that we tend to forget Iraq is a sovereign country. I know we talked about Iraq for much of the last decade as if it was some, you know, if it was a, it was a territory. It's a sovereign country, and Prime Minister Abadi uh, must maintain command and control uh, over the forces inside his country, and and he does. And we've long said that that uh, uh, that, that if you're going to be involved in the fight against ISIL, we want all those things coordinated and under Prime Minister Abadi's uh, command and control. That's the way to achieve a lasting defeat against this group, which is why. Our role has been one, not just because we wanted it, but because Prime Minister Abadi wanted it, one of training, advising, assisting, helping improve their battlefield competency, confidence, and capability so that they could mount this operate well, all these operations, but this one in particular, successfully, and then maintain the defeat of ISIL over time and stabilize Mosul uh, going forward. That can't be done uh, by foreign forces. It, it needs to be done by Iraqi forces. Can you can you talk a little bit about Raqqa? Um, Secretary Carter said today that he thought that the um, advance on Raqqa would uh, be taking place in a few weeks, and it se he seemed to suggest that perhaps the, that the coalition was moving up um, the advance on Raqqa um, with the Kurds yeah. because of potentially some um, some external threats. Yeah, I've seen the Secretary's uh, comments. Um, I don't have much to add. Obviously, we all share a sense of urgency about Raqqa. Secretary Kerry has talked about the importance of um, eliminating uh, Daesh's presence uh, in Raqqa. Uh, I won't get ahead of military operations and, and, and timing. Really, that's much uh, better for, um, for our Defense Department colleagues to speak to, nor will I go into great detail about intelligence assessments. But. I think it is a fact and well known that uh, that uh, Daesh continues to plot against uh, Western targets. They continue to try to inspire foreign fighters to take up uh, their twisted aims in, in countries outside the region, uh, including Western countries. Uh, and so we're always monitoring that threat. It's a very real threat, and we take it seriously. And Raqqa is, um, for all intents and purposes, you know, uh, uh, their their capital in Syria. So it does have significant importance to them, and therefore it must 
by definition have significant importance to those of us who are fighting them. You also said that, if I may, uh, at least did you have a follow up? Um, Just let me. No, no. On the okay. same issue, he also said that uh, that the United States is working to create local local groups to fight ISIS and, and Raqqa. Could you elaborate in, a little in, bit on that? What is, what yeah, is that in keeping with exactly my answer to you before yeah. about indigenous forces? Um, look, in Iraq, um, it, it's it, it's it's much easier to define what indigenous forces are mm -hmm. uh, because you have a uniformed army, and we do have some. Uh, militia forces that are arrayed uh, uh, along with Iraqi security forces. And of course, you have Peshmerga forces. Um, so it's easy to sort of identify and articulate and define in what indigenous forces are in Iraq. It's harder to do that uh, in Syria, obviously. Um, but we, ha we are working uh, and have been working with a number of uh, groups on the ground uh, in Syria. And uh, again, I'd point to my Defense Department colleagues to you know, further identify who they'd be working with with respect to uh, Raqqa, but there are many Syrian uh, forces um, uh, that we have been supporting against Daesh inside Syria, and so, I suspect that they would that they would play a role. So the United States will not, let's say, cooperate with the Syrians or the Russians uh, for the Battle of Raqqa. The, I mean, if 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 they offer that kind of assistance, I, I, I'm not going to hypothesize. I mean, oh. there's no, I, but but let me be clear that there there's no intent or or, or effort. Uh, to coordinate with the Assad regime, and we've said this before, on any counter dash operation inside Syria, there will be no coordination with the Assad regime. Um, uh, and as for uh, the rest of military efforts to go after uh, Daesh inside Syria or uh, uh, in Raqqa, I'd let my Defense Department colleagues speak to that. Turkey arrested the two democratically elected co-mayors of Diyarbakir today, and I wanted to know what your response to that is. Give me a second. I had so we're closely monitoring the situation uh, following the detention of the uh, Diyarbakir's elected co-mayors on charges of supporting terrorism. We strongly condemn, as you know, the PKK's terrorist attacks, and we again call on the PKK to cease that violence, to renounce terrorism, uh, and to re-engage uh, in a peaceful political process that addresses the underlying uh, causes of the conflict. There's no justification for its attacks in Turkey. We urge that any expressions of concern over the co-mayor's detention uh, be peaceful and in compliance with the law. We also urge Turkish law enforcement and other authorities to act with due restraint and respect for the freedom of expression. As Turkish authorities investigate allegations that some local officials have participated in or have provided material support to terrorist groups, uh, we note the importance of respect for due process. This again is nothing new. We've said this time and time again. Respect for due process is enshrined in the Turkish, uh, is as enshrined in the Turkish constitution and will ensure uh, that the results of these investigations will reinforce confidence in the judicial system among Turkish citizens. Would you go as far as the statement that the EU issued in which it, quote, reiterates its call for a political solution, arms must be laid down, a political solution is the only viable option, which seems to be directed both towards Ankara and to the Kurds in Turkey? Would you agree with that statement? I think I've just reacted to your question about the detention of these uh, two individuals. Can I can I interpret it as, as meaning that you're basically saying the same thing as the EU, reiterating your call for a political solution, or is there some distance between you and the EU? You are asking me about the detention of these co-mayors, not about a larger strategic goal. But obviously, look, I mean, uh, uh, the, we've said with respect to the PKK, that we've long said we want them to renounce violence and terrorism and return to the negotiating table. Um, so I mean, I'm not going to parse uh, or try to. Uh, match what I'm saying with what the EU is saying. I think in general, though, obviously we share the same ultimate goals uh, as our European partners do. Let's uh, talk. Uh, I'm going to go. She's been asking for Syria, then I'll go back to you. Go ahead. Thanks much. Last night, Amnesty International issued a press release saying that a month ago it presented the Pentagon with evidence that 11 coalition airstrikes in Syria appear to have led to the deaths of as many as 300 civilians, and that so far that evidence has been met with silence. Why the silence? Do you know? Well, 
I would refer you to my Defense Department colleagues on this. Um, uh, as you know, we take seriously all credible allegations of civilian casualties. The, the Pentagon has a system, uh, a, a fairly comprehensive system for analyzing themselves what these uh, these allegations are, and then when they feel uh, that they warrant further investigation, they do it. And unlike any other military around the world, they actually release the results of those investigations. And unlike any other military around the world, when they do that, if they have to hold people accountable for their actions, they do that too. So your question's better put to the Pentagon. I'm, I'm not aware uh, of uh, what their take is on this report. Um, obviously, uh, we take all such reports seriously uh, and, uh, and we support uh, the Defense Department as they uh, do the proper investigations. So Amnesty's take here is that um, they said in their statement, quote, we fear the U.S.-led coalition is significantly underestimating the harm caused to civilians in its operations in Syria. Uh, your response? Well, we welcome, we welcome the, the, that input and, um, and no reason not to. Uh, believe me, no military uh, tries harder than the United States military to limit, to prevent um, uh, casualties to, to civilians or damage to civilian infrastructure. We take it very, very seriously. Um, and uh, again, uh, not, we're not at all afraid to receive criticism uh, about our efforts and when we believe warranted to fully investigate. Um, and then I said, I said, announce the results of that investigation. So look, uh, as I understand it, this report just came in. Um, I, I'm, I'm gathering that we're probably still going through this, uh, but I can assure you that the, uh, that the Pentagon takes all allegations of civilian casualties very, very seriously. Just one more. So in the case of the 11 strikes that Amnesty examined, the group reported that to date, CENTCOM has acknowledged only one civilian casualty resulting from those operations. Uh, do you think the Pentagon could be um, a bit lenient when investigating itself? The, I can speak from a personal and long history that the Pentagon is not lenient on itself when it comes to investigating its own behavior and conduct, particularly in a time of war. Uh, in fact, nobody's tougher on themselves uh, than military leaders. And again, I would stress to you, no other military, no other military uh, takes this matter more seriously than the United States. Yeah. On Syria, any update on the thoughts in Geneva? No, I don't have any updates for it today. Uh, they continue. Uh, one more. Uh, Turkish president has insisted today that he would liberate uh, members from YPG. Do you have any reaction to that? I haven't seen those comments, but again, I would tell you, uh, as I said yesterday and I think the day before, uh, that uh, we want uh, we, uh, uncoordinated military activity, particularly in that area, is uh, not uh, conducive to ultimate success against uh, Daesh, and uh, we want all members of the coalition to focus their efforts against uh, Daesh and to do so in a coordinated fashion. Yeah. Turkey. Just going back to the detention of the DR workers for mayors, uh, these are pre-trial detention. Uh, would you uh, urge Turkish government, or what's your view on this pre-trial detention without putting them. These are the people elected by 55 percent of the vote and elected officials. I think I answered that question before, that we would urge Turkish law enforcement and other authorities to act with due restraint and respect for freedom of expression. Um, and that as Turkish authorities investigate allegations that some local officials have participated in terrorist acts or supporting terrorist groups, uh, that we would again note the importance of due process. Human Rights Watch uh, NGO just uh, issued a report two days ago uh, regarding uh, the claims of emergency rule uh, in Turkey and basically saying that it gives a blank check to Turkish security uh, forces. Do you have, a, have you seen the report? Do you have any comment on that? Uh, as I understand it, we're still going through that Human Rights Watch report. I really don't have much more to comment on that. U.S.-based, a uh, California-based uh, company, uh, Procera Networks, apparently it has given a uh, software to Turkey, sold software to Turkey, and Turkey, uh, Turk Telecom, has been using that to spy on Turkish citizens. It has been a big report, news report in Turkey. Do you have any kind of sanctions 
on uh, this kind of U.S.-based uh, companies? Yeah, I'm just not at liberty to comment on claims made by employees or former employees uh, of a private company. Uh, I'd refer you to the company for questions like that. I got time for Last just a couple question. more. About how Last many? question of like, like seven or eight? <laughs> I know, I have more than they could sorry about that. Uh, there are about over 130 journalists have been sitting in Turkey. Uh, most of them, majority of them, put in jail since the emergency rule uh, declared about more than three months ago, and you have not issued any statement regarding over 130 journalists. Does it mean that is is it not uh, enough or important for you to oh, uh, express on. your concern? Hey, or, come on, that you have not that, issued a statement. That, I I talk about. The when detention of journalists in Turkey all the time from this podium. You've got me on camera saying it uh, a lot. And nothing has changed about our concern uh, about the, the need for freedom of expression and freedom of the press in Turkey. In fact, I'd venture to say, sir, that I have probably talked more about press freedom in Turkey than in any other, any other nation. The State Department has been nothing but clear and, and candid and forthright, publicly and privately, about our concerns over the state of journalism in Turkey. Uh, I stand by everything we've said. And that you may not have seen a written statement by me on any given day in the, in the last uh, week or two weeks or three weeks doesn't mitigate at all uh, the very real concerns that we continue to have. Half a question? <laughs> Can you really, what, what, half a question because I don't have to give you half an answer, right? Yeah, please, please. <laughs> Matt would probably tell you that's all I'm doing please, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. what, what, <laughs> What, what is Go ahead, and then what, James, I'll finish up. What is the, uh, yeah, I, I got it. Oh, of course you got to <laughs> it. They're, yes, yeah. they're very extremely busy. What, what is the latest on uh, position of Turkey's involvement in this uh, ongoing war? Because Iraq is saying no, Turkey keeps repeating that we are going to in, in Mosul and then Raqqa and, you know. Well, uh, look, I mean, uh, I'm not going to speak for the Turkish military uh, and, and what their plans or intentions are. What I can tell you is uh, we want all efforts in this fight against Daesh to be coordinated through and with the coalition. And that uncoordinated activity is counterproductive to the result. I said that again yesterday. Um, that hasn't changed. But I'm not going to speak for each, uh, each member of the coalition and what they are or they are not doing. We have made our concerns about uncoordinated activity. We've made that clear uh, to all members of the coalition, not just Turkey. OK, James? Thank you, John. Um, in 2012, Secretary Clinton's final year as Secretary of State, federal lobbying records show that a leading defense contractor hired a trio of lobbyists to lobby the Department of State for a larger share of foreign military sales contracts by which, as you know, advanced weapons systems are shared with other countries. Uh, the federal lobbying records show that all three of those lobbyists were uh, large donors or bundlers for Hillary Clinton in both her 2008 and 2016 campaigns. Among those lobbyists was Heather Podesta, whose brother-in-law that year was John Podesta, who that year was serving as a counselor uh, at the Department of State for approximately $130,000 a year and also a member uh, of a policy advisory board that Secretary Clinton created. Uh, as it happened, the gambit appeared to have worked because that defense contractor's share of foreign military sales contracts surged in 2012, uh, with uh, three contracts alone for provision of advanced systems to Qatar, totaling for that firm some $19 billion in contracts. Uh, even if no laws were broken, uh, it would seem a fairly cozy situation, would it not? Well, uh, thanks, James. Um, what I would tell you is that uh, there's a standard procedure here uh, for how contracts are uh, considered and vetted and decided on. Um, and if you'll allow me, I'll just walk through a little bit of that. Please. Each request is assessed on its own merits, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, in accordance with the Arms Export Control Act uh, and the Conventional Arms Transfer Policy, and based upon ongoing defense cooperation uh, engagements by both the Department of Defense and the Department of State with foreign counterparts. Each request from a partner nation must be reviewed and approved by several bureaus uh, within the Department of State and the Department of Defense, uh, which all must generally come to a consensus 
before recommending approval. Uh, so then, as required under the Arms Control Export Act, proposed major sales or transfers must be briefed and formally notified to Congress. Um, so uh, these decisions uh, are based on a pretty comprehensive interagency process that's pretty rigid, too. Uh, it's not just something that any one official here at the State Department can say, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. And the other thing is they're based solely and completely on the foreign policy objectives of the United States of America, and nothing else factors into that. Statutorily, one official here at the Department of State is entrusted with final approval over these transfers. Am I correct about that? Well, I'll, I'll, obviously, the ultimate responsibility, of course, rests on the cabinet official. In this case, it would be the Secretary of State. At DOD, it would be the Secretary of Defense. But they both have to be in concurrence here. Uh, My understanding is state approves these transfers or contracts, defense implements them. Am I wrong about that? You're not wrong, but you're not completely right either. The, uh, obviously, the, the Foreign Military Sales Program is a State Department program, but we do it in close coordination with DOD. Having been in that world, I can assure you that DOD gets, uh, certainly gets a vote. Um, and if there are disagreements between the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State, those are ironed out at that level. So we don't move forward with foreign military sales contracts unless everybody's on board with it, that there's a true interagency development. But yes, who, who uh, quote unquote, signs off on the, the final uh, sale, obviously it's the Secretary of State. That's the way it's enshrined in law. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that there's no coordination or no requirement to make sure we've got a consensus view going forward. Uh, so I think we need to be careful when we say there's one person who makes this decision. Uh, while there's one person who has, you know, final sign-off, that one person can't do it without a whole body of evidence and analysis and review and interagency uh, uh, consensus before they get to that point. What we have here is a situation in which a trio of lobbyists who have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for Hillary Clinton's campaign and earned hundreds of thousands of dollars lobbying her State Department on behalf of this defense contractor, succeeded in securing contracts for that contractor uh, that were far and above uh, what they had received in previous years. And indeed, that contractor, after Secretary Clinton left office, essentially discontinued its re lobbying relationships with those lobbyists. So the appearance, John, is of, the appearance is akin to one of those pop-up stores that materializes just to sell Halloween candy or July 4th fireworks for a seasonal need, and after that seasonal need has been met, vanishes. Well, I'll let you speak to the appearances, James. I mean, that's uh, more your job than mine. I, I can only speak to process, and I certainly can't speak to the decision-making, you know, years ago uh, in terms of each and every contract. Um, I wouldn't do that. What I can assure you, though, is that, uh, that we remain confident in the system and the process that's in place. Uh, and, and the very judicious manner in which contracts uh, or foreign military sales that are dependent upon certain contracts are executed. There is a very lengthy, um, rigorous, sometimes painfully slow. In fact, many of our partners complain about that. It process. wasn't in this case. <clears throat> well, again, sometimes painfully slow. Uh, that is uh, done across the board. Um, and uh, the, there are no, the, the only considerations, the only considerations that are factored into the foreign military sales program is the furtherance of foreign policy uh, objectives of the United States of America and not uh, the efforts by external groups uh, to lobby, as you say, or to influence that decision. Uh, the decisions are made, again, across the interagency and only in furtherance of our foreign policy uh, objectives. One last question. You've been very kind. Throughout your answers to mine and others' questions today, you have frequently uh, relied on your personal knowledge of how things work at this agency and the Pentagon as well. So I'm going to ask you uh, in that vein to tell me, should we imagine that at a time when John Podesta was a salaried counselor here, this very man who wound up as Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman and who is much in the news these days, uh, should we imagine at the very time that John Podesta was a salaried counselor here, Secretary Clinton would have been unaware that her department was being lobbied by Mr. Podesta's sister-in-law? I cannot 
answer that question. I do not know. I would refer you to. But you know how things secretary. work. You're all too frequently <laughs> telling us you know how things work. But I don't know what I don't know what former Secretary Clinton was aware of in terms of uh, uh, of uh, Mr. Podesta's relatives and, and the jobs that they were doing at the time. I couldn't I couldn't possibly speak to that. What I can assure you, though, is, and you know, James, you've been around long enough. You know what the Foreign Affairs Policy Board does. And yes, Mr. Podesta was a member of the board at the time. Uh, I can assure you that. Uh, that his role in the Foreign Affairs Policy Board played absolutely no role uh, in this or any other foreign military sales program. That's not the uh, that's not the objective of the board. That's not their that's not their purview. Uh, and that uh, that he would, as a member of the board, have no role in that. No, none whatsoever. Thank you. You're welcome. Listen, guys. I've got, oh, I'm sorry. You have the you very, have very 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 brief. One one is just in your response to the questions about the Amnesty International report. You said several times you don't you you know of no other military in the world that conducts investigations, publishes the results, and then punishes the, uh, if necessary, holds people up to account. I think account. I said I know of no other military in the world that does it as thoroughly as we do. Oh, okay, as thoroughly as you do. Yes. You surely uh, wouldn't suggest your militaries... NATO allies are Oh, no, I, I, I didn't mean that this. nobody else investigates. Uh, I just mean uh, nobody takes it more seriously than right. they do. Then an, another UN issue. This is the UNESCO vote today uh, on the um, the Jerusalem resolution. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's already been addressed there and, and, and elsewhere. So you don't but, want me to read to you? No, okay. I want to know that, it, but it has an effect in Washington. I want to know that if, if whether uh, you guys, uh, given this vote today to approve this resolution that you so stridently opposed, um, if you are still pushing Congress to restore funding, U.S. funding, that was suspended to UNESCO. Uh, I'll check on that. I'm pretty sure we are, but let me check on that. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you.